sometimes if you have a work that's on your website and you have it in the gallery, then they also will want their commission on top of the sale that you've run. So you have to be really careful and mindful. So as, as I've started to pick up more and more galleries, I have to be a lot more careful with the sales that I'm running that I'm not, it, it's not a conflict, conflict of interest for me. All right, Kelsey, welcome to the show. Again, we had some technical issues to start with some audio, so we did some audio testing, and that's always fun. That's part of the show, right? <laughs> right, part of it. Part of the process. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so we're going to start with the five rapid-fire questions here on the Artist Appeals. Our guest with us, Kelsey, is a painter, and she makes these beautiful trees. That's one of hers in the background, guys. Mm -hmm. So what is your number one top selling piece of art, product, style, or theme? What what moves for you? Animals. Cute little animals seem to move the best so far. So super fun. Cool. Is there a specific animal that you find is trending right now? Um, oddly enough, raccoons. I'm not sure what it is, but raccoons are the biggest uh Foxes also move pretty well, and so do badgers. So. Interesting. Foxes, raccoons, and badgers, they're all kind of in a category, aren't they? Yeah, they're kind of woodlandy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Woodlandy animals. Very cool. Well, thank you for sharing that mm -hmm. with us. What is the one thing you really love to do, make, or create? Like, what's the one thing you just love to make? I love anything that has to do with sort of letting the paint do its thing. You can see in this tree behind me, I've got kind of drips and splashes and all of that. I love to just throw things at the canvas and see where it goes, sort of the spontaneity of it. So. Cool. What's the one thing you hate to do? Uh, prep. Canvas prep. The whole thing. So I usually condense it all into one day. I'll have a whole bunch of them ready and then just gesso a whole bunch. And it's boring. <laughs> I think it's boring. <laughs> you know, putting all the gesso on, getting everything all ready. It's very monotonous, huh? Yes. Yes. Do you have a big space? Do you have like a garage you work in or a big studio? No, I don't. Right now I have a little a little bedroom upstairs it's the smallest bedroom in the house it might be 10 by 10 or something like that we're thinking about finishing off the basement and then making that my studio probably a project for this winter so we'll see that's really cool that's really neat to hear that you have a small space so it just you know goes to show you can create with what you have even if you don't have a mm -hmm. space do you like lay down a tarp or something no so it used to have carpet in there, and then I got sick of having to be really careful with the carpet, and I just ripped it all out, and my husband came home the one day, and he was like, what are you doing? <laughs> I, like, cut the carpet, and I was, like, throwing it out the window, and <laughs> I was like, it's okay, it'll be fine. So oh I God. ran to, yeah, so I ran to Lowe's and got a cheap sheet of that vinyl carpet or vinyl flooring and put it down and so that's what's in there now oh cool you may do i love that that's great yep. that actually leads us to our next uh question which is what is the funniest or weirdest experience you've ever had One of the funniest or weirdest experience i've ever had as an artist yeah like selling Not your art very... going to shows or just tell us a story. Um, tell us a good story. <laughs> maybe two years ago, I went to I went to this art fair, and it was outdoor and along a nice, beautiful river. And you always meet really interesting people at those events. Sometimes it's they're really awesome, and sometimes the experiences are a little bit strange. And at this particular one, there was a fellow who would come up to my booth and stand there and sing to me and just serenade me and and then he'd walk away and he came back and he must have done it like 10 times he'd just stand there and sing to me and it was <laughs> flattering I, it was I was happy to listen to him sing he was a good singer but it was also a little bit strange so ah uh, what was he yeah. singing to you do you remember the song or were they all different it was 
I think that it was in a different language, so I couldn't really understand what he was saying. It was just, it sounded romantic, and it was beautiful, but yeah, I have no idea what he was saying, so. (laughs) Oh, that's great. You got serenaded. Interesting. Very cool. So what is the one piece of business advice that you would give your younger self? This is a traditional question, but it always gives some interesting Mm -hmm. answers. Like if you were starting over today and you wanted to become an artist, what would you tell your younger self? I would say, go for it. Go all in, just go after it. My younger self was sort of scared. I wasn't sure what I was doing. And so I was timid and sometimes I would paint and sometimes I wouldn't and then I would get all in my head about whether or not it was good enough I would say just go for it get after it and make it happen and it'll come yeah very cool how often do you paint like what is your regimen what is your schedule well right now I have small children so that inhibits things a bit so my normal painting schedule (laughs) yeah Normally, I paint either during nap time in the afternoon or else late at night. So they go to bed. I try and have them in bed by nine, and then I'll paint till 12 or one, get a couple hours in in the evening. So, Oh, wow. So about how many paintings do you produce a week or a month? I would say 10 or so. It depends on... It depends on the month and the size of the painting. So if they're little, I can crank out a few more in a month. If they're mm-hmm. bigger than they're, and, and I also have to fit in the business of art in that time frame as well. So I'm not all of those hours are allocated to painting. Some of it's right. prep work or. Right. So. Well, that actually segues very nicely into the appeals of uh, seven steps. So we always going to start with art and um, how did you find your style? So we have the business of art, right? And we try and break it down into art, product, presentation, educating your audience with story or essentially writing about your art, amplifying automation techniques, that kind of thing. That's what we'll cover. Licensing and contract terms and then success. So those are the seven words in the appeals acronym that we kind of walk through here. I love to find out from painters, particularly ones that have kind of a theme, a strong voice going on. How did you find your voice? Well, I started out doing a little bit of everything. And I think everybody does a little bit of sort of imitating other people and that kind of thing. I would do charcoal, watercolor, colored pencil, anything that I felt led to do at the moment. And I had this show at a local art association here, and I was going to put in a whole bunch of different things. And at the last second, I had this fun idea to sort of mix things up. And I added watercolor and charcoal together, which are my two favorite things at the time. And it was like this sort of rainbowy, the coos, the Highland cows. It was a rainbow Scottish Highland cow. And I thought it was a little, it wasn't very like professional art looking. It was a little strange compared to everything else that I had, but I threw it in anyway. And people loved it. Everybody commented on that one, said it was their favorite, and they wanted to take lessons and learn my technique. And I I was blown away. And so I sort of dove into that a little bit more and made that my thing. And it's evolved from there. So when you find something that kind of works from feedback from people, you got to kind of evolve it, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think I saw your Highland cows at the Mount Gretna show where we met and they're like hairy. Mm-hmm. So they're the underlayer is like watercolor, right? And then the graphite is these loopy, spirally, black graphite gritty lines on top, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You don't happen to have one of those laying around there, do you? <laughs> I don't have a Highland cow. I could, I have a horse here. Do you want me to hold that up for you? Yeah, show us your, show us your art. Okay. So here's, um, here's a horse. And so it's evolved a bit because it used to be sort of two layers, the paint and then the charcoal. 
And now I do it in a couple of different layers. I'll paint and then I do some charcoal and then I spray it and put clear gesso. Okay. And then again, and then charcoal again. That way it fixes the charcoal down and it doesn't move and get muddy while I'm painting on top of it. Interesting. So you kind of line. trace the outline of the horse first with char, like you do like a background layer, then you do the charcoal of the horse and you spray it with clear gesso? I spray it with a fixative of some sort. Right now I've been using a uh, golden varnish ah. and then sandpaper that and then put down clear gesso again. Sometimes I use a workable fixative. Interesting. Fun. That is Let's fascinating. So. I'm sorry, say that again? Let me go back in and keep working on it multiple times, multiple layers. Yeah, um, I used charcoal in college and grad school, and then we would fix it with fixative, you know, make it permanent. But I don't think I ever went mm -hmm. back in on top of it. So that's really cool that you're doing paint on top of uh graphite and charcoal that's really cool yeah i think it leads to sort of like a peekaboo sort of storied effect mm -hmm. very cool so um you have little kids and i think this is a great topic to hit on for people because not all of our guests have little kids you know um jennifer smelker who was on I recorded yesterday, her kids are up and out of the nest. And so she's had some really great success, but now she's got a lot of time, you know? So mm -hmm. how do you find time to um, get it all done? This probably fits better <laughs> towards the end in the amplification process, but I got to ask here. So you've got these wonderful big canvases. You've got this room you said you work over um nap time and in the evening but then of course there's all the other things you have to do any tips or tricks you want to share here about how to find your voice if you have little kids do you know what i mean yeah yeah that's that's hard i think that working with little kids is hard because it's it depends so much on the nature of your children Luckily, my children are fairly easy, and they really enjoy art themselves. So there are times when I can set one at a little table beside me, the older one, and she'll paint, and she's happy to do that. And uh, sometimes the little, my two-year-old will sit on my lap while I paint. I, that doesn't last for long, but Aww. so if, if they wake up, I sometimes have a minute or two to wrap up my thought, and then and then be done. Whereas, you know, if you have children that are not quite as flexible, it's easy to see how that would be a lot harder. Um, right. What about, um, so you have a little room that you've dedicated it. Do you, can you just put your brushes in the water or um, are you using acrylic? Yeah, I am using acrylic. And a key part of having your studio set up, at least for me, is I got one of those rollable, lockable tool cabinets, and oh. I keep all of my paint in there and lock it because we had an incident where I was not home, and my husband was attending, but maybe not as well as he could have been, and we <laughs> now have magenta all over the nursery room floor, and I mean, magenta mm -hmm. acrylic paint. So, Magenta is a strong color. That stuff stains. Yeah, and I have girls. So, of course, magenta is the tube they're going to go for. Of course. So. Of course. I think all young kids do. I left my son one time, and he got um, Ranger Ink spray ink and spray painted mm -hmm. his whole, uh, both hands, all up his arms, his belly, and it was all magenta and it's stained. I mean, I put him in the bathtub and it was not coming out. He was magenta for several days. Oh, that's oh a God. great tip. Thank you so much. So the, the mm -hmm. tip of getting a rollable, lockable, I love that. That's a rolling, 
lockable locker if you have kids. So working, I mean, we always have to work during nap time or work when they're asleep, but I like the idea that you work with them too. That's really cool. That's why I invented iConnect Crafts, those little animals, the, my movable man, animals that I mention sometimes in these podcasts. I have these little movable animals. And so I made them for the kids so that they could do a little craft while I was working too. So. Yeah. Yeah. You got to find a way to work with them because there's no way around it. Yeah. Yeah. And otherwise you go crazy. Yes. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Well, very good. Thank you for those tips. All right. How about product? I know you do a lot of craft fairs. How many fairs do you do like a year? And what do you take? It's been sort of building up the last few years. So I, I was only doing one or two a year. Now this year I did, I think it'll be four or five by the end of the year. So okay. and I try to take something in every price point, everything from cards all the way up to a big 48 by 48 like I have behind me here. That way there's a little bit of something for everybody. Right. What sizes do you mainly work in? Do you keep them a consistent size all the time? No, I no, I don't. I work everything from small. I do these little wood slice ornaments that are maybe four inches in diameter to okay. very large paintings. I do okay. murals too. Very cool. How do you price them? I have a square inch price that I'm using right now. And okay. it, there's a system to it and a, and a calculation that goes into all that. So <laughs> a square inch pricing. So mm -hmm. I've heard with some painters that they'll try and calculate how much paint they use per painting, like an average They'll kind of try and calculate how much time it takes them to do one. I've heard some people that use, you know, just a standard pricing per size. Other artists might try and uh, price based on the complexity of the art. Can you just give us a little bit of an overview of how you price? Because I know that's a big hot topic for artists is just give us the kind of the foundation for your thought process on how you price your art. Sure. No. Uh, simple is better for me. So I have, I, I also heard somebody gave me the advice of having like a running tally on the back of each painting for how many hours you're putting in and, and then Ooh. the supplies and all of that. But sometimes I go back and I work on them later. And then, so then the price would go up and you're not really supposed to have your price fluctuate a lot. So I just do square inch. Uh, all of my eight by tens are the same price. All of the 16 by twenties are the same price. It's simple for me. I feel like it's simple for my customers. So I have, there's, um, there's a spreadsheet that I use where it takes into account how much time you think it would take to make a certain size. And uh -huh. then, and then maybe a bulk park material price and then your overhead in the studio. And then it comes out with a square inch price at the bottom. So that's what I base it off of loosely. And then I just go from there and apply it to everything. Very now for cool. the, for the really big ones, the square inch price goes down somewhat so that they're not astronomically priced. But. Oh, okay. So talking about products, you say you bring stuff that's little all the way up to the top. What do you find your best products are? And can you give us any tips or tricks about how you like to produce them? Do you make them yourself? Anything that's like hand done, I of course make myself. Ornaments are all handmade, that kind of thing. I also use art storefronts for my website. So I get a lot of my prints, canvas prints and things like that from the back end of my website because they are a, a print on demand self-fulfilling kind of website Fantastic. so that's super handy yeah yeah so um presentation oh going to fairs is hard i've done a couple this year i normally do business to business conferences for iConnect crafts but this year i thought oh i'm gonna do some craft fairs some outdoor ones so i did capona and i did one that was indoor so i've got a system for indoor but 
I discovered outdoor was really hard. So can you talk a little bit about your presentation and how you set up and if you've got any tips or tricks for us on uh, setup and systems for shows? Yeah, I I use an easy up tent. I think that's key. It's just me that sets up because my husband has to stay home with the kids. So everything that I do as far as setting up for festivals, I have to be able to do myself. Um, I have to be able to lift it myself. So yeah. I have the Flourish mesh panels that go on the walls, and they're super light, super easy to put up. So, Flourish so. mesh panels. I'm going to have to look them up. Do you yeah. have an easy up that you um, recommend? I was asking around before I did my shows, and I, I heard all sorts of different um, things. And the price ranges were like from, oh, they can get really expensive. I am a cost conscious artist. So I got my easy up and the, and the mesh panels as a package deal on the Facebook marketplace. So oh, I got, wow. yeah, I got a smoking deal and uh, I could not tell you what, what the model of the tent actually is, but I do know that the, the panels are flourish. So. Very and, cool. Way to go. So check mm -hmm. Facebook Marketplace. That's a good idea. I yeah, to look people there. Are always, yeah, people are always getting out of it. And you can find a great deal if you're willing to be thrifty and keep an eye out for, you know, maybe a couple months over the winter season when people are trying to get rid of stuff. It's right. A great resource. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Okay. Um, how about educating? So we've talked about art, product, presentation. Um, oh. With presentation, you know, you do mostly outdoor craft shows, right? And art fairs and stuff like that. How do you qualify which ones you do? Like, have you been finding that some are more successful than others? How do you rank them? How do you decide I'm going to do this one, not that one? Because, I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot to choose from. There are. And that's something that I've had to learn as I go. I've definitely gone to some events where I did not make enough money for the effort to have been worth it. And so some really good advice that somebody told me one time was that if beer and corn dogs are the main draw, uh, that's not the event for you. And uh, that is, that is great advice. I found that to be really true. And so I can't always get there to the event before I apply. Mm -hmm. And so I'm always like, you know, you apply and you hope that it's not being marketed as an art fair and it's and ends up being a beer fest. Um, and sometimes that happens and, and, you know, it happens, but. Interesting. So definitely. maybe check their food, check their food vendors or. I Yeah, I try and look at maybe if you can find pictures, like a gallery of images from a past event, mm -hmm. you know, are there, does it look like it's a lot of fine art or does it look like there's like a lot of, I mean, if you're a, if you're a craft person and, and you're going to take craft items then it should be a craft show, but if you're trying to sell big paintings and things like that, then maybe you want it to be more of a fine art show. You just have to kind of keep an eye on the customer yeah. base that you see in those. Right, right. Have you ever heard of Craft Fair Insider? No. Oh, that's, that's probably what you should look up. Resource. Um, a okay. friend of mine told me about that, and it's like a forum where people talk about craft fairs. You got to check that one out. I was looking on there. I got referenced to check them out because I was looking for a tent like we were talking about. And yeah. I'm not sure that's the best place to buy a tent because they know what they have and they know if they paid for it. So you can get really high quality tents there. But um, a lot of people that were selling them were the, uh, oh, the big ones that are like, they started like $1,500 or something crazy and they weren't marking mm -hmm. them down that much. And they were like, oh, you got to come and get this thing. Mm -hmm. And I live in Ohio, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> wherever they live. But it had some really great resources on uh, people thought of the different fairs. So that was kind of cool. Okay. Cool. Check it out. Um, okay. 
So how about educate? So how do you let people know about your work? You said you have a website on art storefronts. How do you market your work? What have you found to be the best way to let people know about your work? I try word of mouth. So I, I'm in a couple of different galleries around here. And so people come in and then they learn about me that way. I also do Instagram and social media quite a bit. And then I also do art fairs. It's kind of, you know, a guerrilla warfare approach. you got to get out there and use every method you can. Yeah. How often do you post? I lately, not as much as I should be, maybe once a week. Okay. But I would say a, a few months ago when I was doing really well at it, I do maybe every other day. And I was mm-hmm. really seeing the following grow. Now, I think the algorithm has changed quite a bit recently. And so everybody's frustrated with that. And it is what it is. But Right. So you just use Instagram? You kind of stick to one? I, yeah, I mainly use Instagram. And then I do that you know thing where it automatically sends it to Facebook as well. Oh, nice. Post. Very cool. Do you do an e um an email newsletter or anything as well? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do an email newsletter as well. And at every show that I go to, I do the fishbowl technique. Have you heard of that? Where you have a fishbowl and you ask people to put a card in or something, or like yeah, tell them about it. yeah, you do a free a free print giveaway and people put in their name and their email. And then you add them to the newsletter and then give somebody from the show a free print at every one. That helps to build your email list. And then every time I have an event, I'll let everybody know, hey, I have an event coming up or I have a sale on the website, that kind of thing. Very cool. How often do you run sales on your website? Not often. I did more at first. Art Storefronts really pushes the sales. And they do a really great job at all of their marketing advice. Yeah. But the last year or so, I've just done Black Friday. It's to be a little bit much sometimes if you're running too many sales at the same time. So I just, I do Black yeah. Friday and hope that everybody. It's a lot of work to set up a sale because you got to tell them the sale's coming and then you've got to make the coupon and right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it can be touchy too. If you have galleries and things like that, they're not always super friendly to you having sales on your website. And then, then they might take, sometimes if you have a work that's on your website and you have it in the gallery, then they also will want their commission on top of the sale that you've run. So you have to be really careful and mindful. So as, as I've started to pick up more and more galleries, I have to be a lot more careful with the sales that I'm running that I'm not, it, it's not a conflict, conflict of interest for. Makes sense. For my Makes sense. And that actually leads us nicely into automation, I think. So galleries, you're doing more and more galleries. How do you find them? How have you found galleries? How did you get into them? Um, I usually try and go out and spend a day, maybe once a quarter and just kind of walk around and go in and, look and see what their art is, make sure that I think that my art would be a good fit there. If possible, I love to talk to the owner and just get a sense for how, you know, if they're upbeat about the art market or if they're feeling, you know, like it's it's not as good of a, a business move to be in the art market. You can usually tell the people that are really excited and enthusiastic to sell art if you talk to them for five minutes. Um, yeah. So I like the people. I like the people that are enthusiastic about what they do because I feel like their customers are going to feel that, and then my art is most likely going to sell there better. Yeah. So, so you actually make a day of it, going around and going out to the galleries. Yeah, and that's fun for me too because it's actually a shopping trip. I, I like to collect art myself, so um, yeah. Sometimes, like I tell. Some of my galleries, you know, I might spend more than I make here at first because (laughs) I love all of the art that you have. And so I'm prone to walk in to deliver my art and then pick up a couple things on the way out (laughs) at the same time. Yeah. 
Now, do you um, pitch them when you first go in or you're just kind of like going incognito, like reconnaissance mode? You're like going in stealth style. Do you tell them you're an artist and try and get their contact? Do you take work with you or do you wait till the second or third meeting? No, definitely stealth mode at first. (laughs) Um, I just want to figure out if, you know, what the vibe is. For, for the normal customer walking in and and if it's nice and I like it and I go maybe two or three times and it's and I feel that it's great, usually they'll figure out that I'm an artist somehow. They'll ask or something and then we can work a relationship from there. But I don't go in, you know, with my portfolio and go, hey, you should take a look at my stuff, that kind of thing. So. Yeah. Yeah, totally. So you just, do you ever ask for their card? You, how do you handle that? I always find that to be that kind of awkward transition, like from talking to someone in a gallery is easy, but then to transition to that, like, oh, hey, uh, can I get your contact information? I kind of feel like, you know, it's like asking a guy for his number or something like it. There's that awkwardness. How do you handle it? I usually try and, sort of talk to them about their artist space and say something along the lines of, you know, if you're, do you have any openings or are you really full right now? That kind of thing. And if, if it seems like they're open to looking at new work, I say, by the way, you know, if you're looking for people and you want to have a look at my work, I have a, I have a website and I do try to keep my website fairly professional looking so that it would be easy for somebody to get on there and, have a look around and know what my aesthetic and my feel is. Mm-hmm. Um, that makes it easy for them so that they can have a look at my, you know, portfolio, so to speak, without even having to ask me. So I might leave them my card and let them reach out to me if they're interested. Okay. Uh, a little bit less high pressure for them, I think, that way. Yeah, yeah. That's great. I love that tip, though, about asking about their artist base and, if they're full or if they have space, that's a really great opener of, you know, to get a feel of how busy they are and if they need more. That's I. That's a great tip. Thank you. I might be using that one someday. <laughs> <laughs> so are there any ways, apps, software, any kind of systems that you use for the um, follow-up at galleries or follow up with people you meet at craft shows and fairs? Like what are your favorite apps or systems for doing more with kids? Cause we're, we're in this amplification phase of like, there's so much to do social media and how do you, how do you get it all done? Uh, MailChimp I think is great. That's a great software. I think, that's the industry standard for reaching out to your mailing list and letting people know what's going on. Art storefronts have been great for me so far. Mm-hmm. They're, they're fairly easy to work with. I think that their technical support is good. So those are the two main things that I use. I have some spreadsheets, just Excel spreadsheets that I use as well. But mm-hmm. what are those for? Them. What do you keep in them? Like accounting, finances? Pricing calculations, that kind of thing. Some inventory type things like that. Nothing too, nothing too crazy. Accounting some, although I I really should move it into QuickBooks. I need to do that this month probably and get it really legit and official. So how do you organize all your paintings and track them? I'm pretty fortunate in that things tend to sell pretty easily. So I don't have, I mean, I have over my desk, this, it's almost like a bunk bed platform that I can stack everything on top. Mm -hmm. So I put everything up there that hasn't sold yet, but mostly things seem to go fairly well. One of the galleries that I'm in uses Ricochet and it's an easy, inventory system where I can go in and see what's sold and what's not. If I have questions about what they have, it's super easy to just sign into the app and see it. 
So that's nice because I don't have to have my own tracking system for what's at that gallery specifically. Cool. So. Well, that's what I was kind of asking. Like, how do you track what paintings are at what gallery? And then you said they might be on your website too. So I was just curious if you have a system for that yet. Yeah, well, in, in the back end of art storefronts, they also have these little folders that you can put everything in. So okay. you, can name, you can name a folder, you know, the gallery, and then move the paintings around. And so, you know, where, wherever they happen to be moving around to. Oh, nice. Nothing, okay. Your customers don't have to see it on the front end. Mm -hmm. You just have it that way on the back end and it's a way to keep track of your inventory somewhat. I had tried, you can also use artwork archive. That's, that's a good way to do it. It so I is. Find that that's I large. had the founder of that on the show. I don't remember what episode okay. number it is, but artwork archives, um, the one of the founder, you know, he started that for his mom. Oh, I did not know that. No. That's really yeah, sweet. she was an artist and she lost all of her artwork in like a fire or a hardware hard uh, hard drive crash. I, I forget what the exact story is, but she lost all of her artwork and it was really, really bad and really upsetting. And so he built this software for her because of that. Oh, that's so sweet. Yeah, and then well, very cool. That brings us to L for licensing and contract terms. Do you have any contracts or have you licensed your work? And what kind of tips and tricks would you be willing to share with our audience about that type of thing? What do you, what has been your experience so far with that? I haven't done a ton of licensing, but I do do contracts because I do quite a bit of commission work. So mm -hmm. if it's a large commission, and I don't know the folks, then I do require them to sign a contract. Usually the contract will have a fairly clear outline of what the project is going to be. So if it's going to be a, a tree in such or such a color scheme and that kind of thing, whatever discussion we've had about their expectations for the piece, a timeline so that they know their expectations for deadlines from me. Yeah. Um, and then it's a payment schedule so that they understand my expectations for them in that regard. And then it has, you know, the legalese at the end about, um, you know, acts of God and all of things like that. Um, it should also have something in it about whether or not they have the rights to the image. So are they allowed to reprint it or not? That kind of thing that goes into some of my illustration contracts. So that's a good thing to have. Um, the payment schedule, do you do thirds? I've heard that's fairly common to do like a third up front before you even get started. And then tell us about your process for doing commission work and the payment schedule, how they match up. Hmm. It, it's rather project specific. So the okay. larger the project, I think the less I tend to take up front. I want to make sure oh. that whatever whatever I take up front is going to cover my materials at least. And then, so I'll do, I'll need a, a materials deposit and then I might do a sketch for them. And then after the sketch is done and approved, then I want maybe, maybe the next, I might do a quarter up front and then I want the next quarter. Okay. And then once we are fairly far along in the painting process, I might show it to them again and then require the next order and then when it's done I want the next I want the final payment before the product actually goes to them oh so. fantastic so quarters that's really good and you do a sketch and and an approval how many sketches do you do do they get to change them they can change them if they want I haven't had a ton of people do a, a lot of back and forth because a lot of the work that I do is based on pictures I do a lot of pet portraits and that kind of thing Oh, so, okay. So they um, give you a, a photograph of their pet and then you do it in your style? Yeah. Yeah, that's fairly common um, and super fun to do because it's not a ton of creative work for me um, as far as the actual 
brain child of coming up with the ideas and things. Um, I like that. Illustrations are a little bit different. I've done a few books and then, oh. and that is a little bit more of a back and forth. And so, yeah. Tell us just briefly about the book illustration process. That's really cool. So with books, I will usually do more of, um, you do like the upfront sketching and then go through and paint everything. And I try and send them all of the sketches. There was, there was one where there was like 30 different things. So we did that in phases of 10 at a time, three chunks of 10. And they would approve everything. And then at the end, they came back and wanted some, maybe like it was a Christmas book. So they wanted a, a Christmas tree in the shop window here and the Santa Claus there and that kind of thing. And those things can be easy to add. How did you get hooked so. into that? How did you get hooked into book illustration? Or did you go to school for it? Or No, just word of mouth. Uh, our friends and family know that I'm an artist. And so in both cases, it was friends that were like, oh, you know, I know an artist. <laughs> and just gave my name to somebody who was writing a children's book. And so I did it that way. Oh, neat. That's fun. What are some of your books yeah. that you've illustrated? So the one there, I've done three that are like around dogs. Um, mm -hmm. The one was like a little story about a, a puppy at Christmas and, and the story of Christmas from the Christian perspective. And then the other one was about puppies and what to do if you get a puppy. And so that was cute. And then the other one was about COVID and the COVID shot and how we need to all be kind to each other during this time. And it was also puppy themed. So very cool. Very cute. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Well, finally, S for success. So I always like to ask, how do you measure success and how do you celebrate it? Because it's different for everyone. Oh, goodness. You know, I think that if my family is happy and they all feel like they're well taken care of at home. And if I feel like my soul is being fed, then I think that I'm successful at the moment. The ways that I know that I'm getting off the beaten path are if, if loose ends are dropping and my children are very obviously, you know, not doing well or grumpy or whatever, you know, you have it. Then I know that I need to recalibrate and, and uh, rebalance. So that's a that's a really good way to keep the needle where it needs to be. Keep my like keep my that. loved ones taken care of. I like that, but you didn't forget yourself too, because I think sometimes artists we forget ourselves, and moms moms forget our our ourselves. We we put ourselves on the back burner. So the fact that you're doing both is fantastic, and it's such a wonderful, um, simple way of tracking success. It's funny. I've heard so many different things from. I don't have to wake up to an alarm clock and that's their measurement of success to, you know, some financial monikers of, can I pay myself? It, it really runs the gamut. So I love it. So I love the fact that you are looking at, is my family good? And is my soul fed? That's beautiful. Well, Kelsey, where can people find your work? Um, if they wanted to hire you for a commission for, a book to illustrate a book or to get a commissioned piece of their pet or to just buy an original or a print, where can they see your work? They can go to KelseyShowalter.com or on Instagram or Facebook. It's the same Kelsey Show Walter art. So. Very cool. Well, thank you yeah. so much for being on and sharing such wonderful information. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. What uh, show are you doing next? The next one is the the holiday show at the Goggle Works in Reading. So where I just was. Uh, yes, you were just there. Yeah, they're having a a holiday show the first weekend of December. So I'll oh, be there. Cool. Well, you'll have to put me on your list, and I'll come check it out. I didn't know they were doing one. That'll be great. Yeah, yeah. All Love right. to see you again. I'm going to get on that mailing list and uh, come come see the show at the Goggle Works. That's a great venue. Really, okay. really great place. 
So very cool. Yeah. Well, cool. I hope to see you there. All right. Well, thanks for joining us. Yeah. Thank you. Hope you have a great day.